He was the Senior Vice President of Business Development and Sales at ESS Inc., which is a USEA member now. ESS is a cutting edge battery technology company, and they are certain and sure to play a major role in the coming years as more is built around the world. So let's welcome Hugh. Thank you, Vicki, and uh, thank you, USEA, for this wonderful invitation to participate in this panel. We are a proud new member of USEA, so thank you for that. Uh, the story, uh, next slide, please. Uh, the story uh, that I want to share with uh, participants this morning is really the story of an American company um, based on American research and helped along the way by the U.S. government uh, through the DO Department of Energy. Uh, and their Advanced Research Projects Agency, uh, ARPA-E, in fact. Uh, we started a little over a, a decade ago. We're based in Oregon. Uh, we are the proverbial garage shop uh, inventor, um, which is literally how they started the, the business. Uh, we're now headquartered in Wilsonville. It's a town about 15 miles south of Portland. And we have our manufacturing facilities, our R&D, engineering, all the product development, everything sits in this facility currently, uh, where we're in the process of scaling up uh, our battery module production in order to achieve uh, our ambitions, uh, certainly for the U.S., but also uh, internationally in the energy storage unit. We play, a, we think, a, a critical role in the energy storage spectrum, and I'll, and I'll talk to that in a moment. Um, but suffice to say, uh, we have Great backing. Uh, we recently went public uh, on the New York Stock Exchange. Our, our ticker symbol is GWH for gigawatt hour. And uh, very excited about the future we have uh, ahead for us. Uh, next slide, please. Um, what's behind our company and why we're so excited? Uh, I think as most of the participants here would be well aware, uh, decarbonization of our grid is now a mega trend. Um, in the US, uh, more than a quarter of our energy, according to the EIA earlier this year, uh, is now delivered on an annual basis uh, from clean energy, from renewables. And, <clears throat> excuse me, um, and that's not just a, a, a U.S. trend. That's actually an accelerating trend we're seeing around the world. Earlier this year also, uh, the EU increased their renewable portfolio standards, uh, bumped it up from 32% by the end of this decade to 40%. And we're seeing that consistent pattern around the world with the pressure for uh, decarbonization, climate change uh, taking place and, and all the implications that it brings uh, is really driving that. In fact, uh, now in California, they've recognized uh, the urgency of it and uh, they're targeting specifically long duration storage uh, to help meet the needs. Next slide, please. <clears throat> um, why is long duration uh, something to talk about here? Um, the challenge that we have is when you have a grid that increasingly relies on intermittent energy supply, such as renewable, when the sun go down, goes down, obviously you don't have solar energy, the wind doesn't always blow. Uh, that intermittency creates challenges for grid operators. And what we've seen uh, is a consistent pattern around the world, um, first probably noticed in the, in the US, in California, uh, the so-called duck curve. We we call it kind of a Nessie curve because uh, it's starting to look like a double hump curve in the, in the morning now. Um, but as you get above about 25% penetration uh, renewable on a on a grid, you start seeing these uh, this blue line, this kind of phenomenon where you get these steep drops in the morning and even steeper rises in the afternoon. And the problem that creates, obviously, is you've got to turn on uh, fossil fired power plants to help meet those ramps. <clears throat> With energy storage, you can solve for that. And over the last several years, uh, about a decade ago, we started to enter into uh, a realm where energy storage could be economically uh, brought to market and in short duration, typically in the 15 to 30 minutes is how the industry really got started a decade ago. But in the last several years, uh, a four hour energy storage uh, duration was kind of the, the the commodity product, if you will. But what we're seeing now in grids uh, in California is where the start we're seeing it happen elsewhere, where you get that larger penetration of renewable energy. The four hours doesn't cut it. 
um, you've got five, six, seven hours of that ramp that you've now got to span with energy storage or fossil fired power plants, which obviously defeats the purpose if we're trying to decarbonize the grid. So long, story, long duration storage uh, really is kind of a, a key part of the future decarbonized grid. Next slide. We define uh, long duration storage uh, for our business and what we think the grid needs as a, as a key part of the storage spectrum is being able to shift the demand from roughly four hours to out to 12 hours. <clears throat> the 12 hours kind of is a magic number in a sense that if you compare um, uh, eight to nine hours of solar with a, with a solid 12 hours of similar capacity that you could stretch out to 16, um, because your loads at night not, aren't necessarily the same as they are in the day, you've got the opportunity to A, replace peaker plants, which are currently the um, primary source that grid operators rely on for meeting those steep ramps in the afternoon, but also the potential to start beginning to replace a base load energy and provide a 24 hour reliable solution. Ultimately, you've got to bring the reliability to the grid um, and that's what the key role that storage plays in long duration storage uh, to provide that on an around the clock basis uh, in absence of any type of fossil fired power plants to operate the grid. Next slide. We solve it in, in our technology. Um, we, have, we have two types of segments that we approach. And, and let me just pause to sort of introduce what that technology is. It's iron flow battery technology. And without getting too technical for the audience here, the chemistry in our battery is iron saturated in salt water. And it flows through a sandwich of cells that across which uh, what happens, the iron during a charging cycle is collecting on a plate of carbon that we call electrodes. And the amount of that plating of that electrode, of that iron on that electrode basically constitutes the charging. And when you wanna discharge the battery, you simply reverse the polarity. You're not changing the direction of the flow. You're not uh, changing any, anything else in the system. You're just simply flipping a switch to change the polarity. And that iron wants to dissolve back into solution. Now we didn't invent that, that electrochemistry. That actually came out of American uh, university research more than four decades ago. Um, but we, what we did invent was a way to make that process, um, in theory, infinitely reversible without degradation or wear on the battery. And we do that in a closed loop system where we continuously process the electrolyte, that liquid, after every charge cycle to incorporate or process the side reactions that take place in, in the electrolyte during the charge cycle. Taking that one step further, that, that kind of is the desktop uh, explanation of what's happening inside the battery. How do you turn that into a product? We've, we've evolved over the last decade now to two product platforms. First is this containerized on the left side you're seeing here, which is a turnkey battery, primarily intended for commercial and industrial customers. It's got everything you need inside. It's got the electrolyte, it's got the battery modules, it's got all the power controls, and it can be an AC or a DC flavor, depending on your requirements. <clears throat> on the right side, you're seeing a, a version of it, same battery modules and same basic technology inside, but just packaged a little differently, and it's a battery in a building that we call a, an energy center. This is the system that is primarily intended for large-scale renewable integration or large grid applications on a standalone basis. And what's unique about that configuration is that you completely separate the battery module uh, and the power side of a system from the energy storage capacity. And you do it in the following way, in that the battery modules that we designed today, they have a capability of storing effectively 12 hours of energy inside each module. <clears throat> that, that can be equated to sort of the gap, if you will, or how deep we can plate the iron on the electrodes, if you want to think of it that way. The actual energy storage is the amount of, of electrolyte or the liquid that we store. And so you've got that variability up to 12 hours. We simply would size the tanks and the amount of electrolyte to provide an application four, six, eight, up to 12 hours of electrolyte. And what's really unique about 
all of this is that iron saturated in salt water is pretty dang cheap. It's about the cheapest marginal cost of any energy technology, storage technology out there anywhere in the world. And it consists of some of the most earth abundant materials you could imagine, iron, <clears throat> iron, salt, and water. And so this is the, uh, what we see as the future for a key part of decarbonizing the grid is these large scale energy center type projects uh, where we can variably size the energy capacity storage to meet a particular grid owner's need, an operator's need, utilities need, uh, and also flexibly expand that over time by just simply adding more liquid. The basic technology would not need to be uh, changed or added to in any way. Next slide. Some of the attributes of this particularly unique chemistry, iron flow, um, is in, in the ability to uh, provide any kind of functional or, or technical application it can meet. And uh, we draw contrast against lithium ion, which is kind of the battery uh, technology of choice to date. Um, in the case of lithium ion, some of the challenges are well known um, around safety, um, but also around degradation. Um, less well known, and unless you're in the industry and you've been uh, familiar with some of the limitations of how you can actually operate the battery, uh, you've got thermal buildup, you've got safety, you've got warranty concerns that kind of limits the flexibility of how you can use that battery. Um, in our case, you can flexibly operate it uh, in, a, in a sense where you can go full charge for as hard as you want to push the battery, immediately switch to a, uh, a discharge, and you can do that back and forth all day. In that regard, we consider an iron flow battery technology a workhorse battery because it, it just it's uh, impervious to any concerns around heat buildup or any type of degradation. The key, key, key attribute of a flow battery and an iron flow battery being the fact that you don't wear the battery out with cycling, unlike most other battery technologies. The other aspect, and I'll tie it back to what we said when we, uh, in theory, have a battery that could operate in infinite cycling, uh, we've tested our battery out to over 10,000 cycles, and we're confident the battery can go even even more than 20,000 cycles. And when you translate just even what we've tested to, uh, we're talking decades of operation without any loss of performance of the battery. Now, of course, you'll have normal wear and tear on pumps and motor drives, but the basic battery technology, the electrolyte, the plumbing, that can last for decades. <clears throat> and so you think about a workhorse battery that's gonna last for a long period of time, you start realizing how low a cost uh, that, that battery can perform that service uh, to a grid. One of the uh, lesser known aspects about uh, this type of electrochemistry is that it operates at about 105 degrees Fahrenheit without need for air conditioning. So if you think about places where large solar tends to be deployed, American Southwest, for example, tends to be hot places. Here's a battery that can sit out in the desert all day long. It does not require air conditioning. It can operate up to about 125 degrees before we actually start thinking about cooling uh, some of the digital components or inverters and that type of thing. Um, and last, uh, uh, in terms of some key advantages of this particular type of battery technology, obviously being a water-based battery, uh, you don't have any flammability issues. You don't have any explosion issues. So we like to characterize it as safe for people and safe for the planet. <clears throat> in fact, the uh, electrolyte itself in most jurisdictions, um, it would be considered a, a, a mild fertilizer if it were to be poured on the ground. Um, it's compliant to with certain treatment to neutralize pH, can literally be put into wastewater systems. And that speaks to the benign nature of that of that electrolyte that's used in our battery. Next slide. So how does this all uh, meet needs of customers and, and what the grid? Uh, obviously, when you've got a longer duration battery that can be cycled indefinitely, uh, used without limitation, uh, you're gonna bring greater resiliency to the grid. We think that's kind of key, the uh, uh, attribute that's increasingly being uh, valued around the world, uh, particularly in the US. What was once these once in a century, once in a lifetime type of climate change events, we're now starting to see annually, 
when starting to see even sometimes uh, multiple times in the year. You know, the Texas freeze went to the Texas heat. Um, both of those events were uh, massive uh, impacts on power power costs and the power markets uh, in that part of the U.S. Uh, having long duration energy storage obviously can help mitigate those things. Out in the West, for example, we're seeing increased uh, wildfire uh, conditions, uh, dry, drier climate, and the practice has now become uh, a matter of routine, if you will, uh, for the utilities when they're facing those conditions to de-energize the lines and turn off whole communities, whole swaths of the state, in fact, uh, for many hours, sometimes many days. Uh, so having long duration storage that could be paired with renewable resources helps communities, helps utilities to ride through those because you can locate those types of resources out close to where those communities are. And <clears throat> being able to do so uh, in a low cost manner because you wouldn't deploy those just for that purpose, a battery that you could use for grid support services, for the bulk energy, as well as be available for that, that resiliency event, if you will, uh, enables the battery to achieve really low cost because the more you use it, the cheaper it becomes over time. Um, last, and I'll go to the next slide, uh, let me talk about um, one of the attributes that sort of sets this technology apart in the US uh, and increasingly around the world. Um, new technologies are hard to hard to get behind uh, from the customer side, from the investors, from lenders and, and financiers. Um, that's true for any technology in, in any market. It's uh, no less true for us. Um, just the scale of the investments uh, that much greater. So uh, a key attribute to adoption and, and getting this technology out into the marketplace has been the introduction of a insurance back warranty. So we provide, in this case, uh, a 10 year extended warranty around the battery and the electrolyte management system, which are really the, the only unique pieces that go into the battery. Everything else is off the shelf components. Um, having that warranty come from ESS sounds all fine and good, but when you've got it backed by a global tier one insurance, uh, really the gold standard, if you will, for energy infrastructure, um, Munich RE, um, that gives a great deal of confidence to customers, to grid operators, to utilities, uh, to get behind a technology that's while new and still relatively young, um, confidence that they can, they can see a future for this technology in helping to decarbonize the grid. Next slide. <clears throat> Last, and uh, I'll end here, uh, my comments. Uh, we wouldn't be um, true to our mission if we couldn't talk about the sustainability of, of the technology. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the key ingredients that go into an iron flow battery, really the iron, salt, and water. Um, everything that goes into the balance of a system here is plastic, it's aluminum, things that are easily recyclable today with existing means. Um, but we also look at the uh, cradle to grave profile of this technology. And we've, we've had outside independent analysis uh, conducted by University of California, uh, Irvine, where they compare this type of technology made in America and to any other technology out there on a cradle to grave basis, the global warming potential uh, of this technology is two thirds lower than uh, the mainstream technology being lithium ion. Um, and last, and by no means least, when you're at the end of the life of this or you're looking to retire this system, there's multiple different pathways for recycling all the contents, including putting them into new batteries. The electrolyte is completely reusable in another battery. Uh, the batteries can be redeployed um, if needs change. Um, but ultimately, at the end of life, all of the materials in this uh, are 100% recyclable. You don't have any toxicity or any landfill or any of those liabilities that that come to uh, an owner of this type of technology uh, decades down the road. So hopefully I can, I've shared some of the attributes of this really innovative technology and why we're so excited about it for uh, decarbonizing the grid and, and helping the world to achieve uh, those types of, of goals. Uh, we're off to a great start in the US and we're, we're proud to be a, an American uh, born and bred technology and, and uh, building our technology here in the US. Thank you, and I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you so much. That was very informative, and the work that you're doing is just incredible. 
this can be a significant game changer, as, as you know, and you said you just recently went public um, for the electricity, information, technology, transportation sectors, many sectors, this can be a, a, a game changer. So how do you see this scaling up to, to meet demand? And I also noted that on uh, one of your slides, you said you'll begin customer trials starting in 2022. So mm -hmm. tell me um, a little bit more about that and, and, and you know, where you have currently, or maybe you can't say that, been in trials, but uh, uh, just just of interest. And then also as, as you talk, and um, I know there are parts of the world where where um, battery technology would be very helpful. And do, do you see parts of the world that are widely embracing this technology? Sure. Um, <clears throat> multiple questions there. Thank you for those, yes. uh, Vicki. I do. Uh, so we won't get cut off you. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. That's great. Strategy. Uh, well, so first off, uh, the the to answer your first question around trials, we're actually shipping product today. You know, the containerized version in the shipping container that I depicted in one of the slides, that's going out to customers already. Um, we've started shipping several months ago. We've got customer orders on four continents. We're in Australia. We're in Latin America. Uh, we're in Europe uh, and the U.S. Um, we also see a, an immense amount of attention for our technology in kind of emerging markets like sub-Saharan Africa. A lot of interest there, um, not the least of which to help bring electricity to underserved communities and, and countries. Um, but sort of the environmental conditions are also really conducive for technology like ours that can stand up to those harsh environmental, you know, the heat and so forth. Um, the fact that it's a real simple technology also is appealing because as I like to say, um, if you've got a diesel mechanic in your village, um, which most everybody in emerging markets lives off of diesel gen sets, you've probably got an overqualified technician to do the maintenance on our system because it's just a couple of pumps um, and valves. So uh, real suitable for those markets. The trials that we're excited about um, are actually starting with the utility scale. And so we've got partnerships that we'll be announcing uh, here shortly. Uh, for utility scale trials, which is the battery in a building, uh, as I call it, the energy center. And those will be breaking ground in 22. Um, we've got a really robust uh, set of uh, parties that are interested for projects that we would go to commercial scale in 23 and beyond um, and start really seeing uh, some impacts on the grid in that way. <clears throat> well, thank you. Thank you, Doug. I mean, you and uh, all of this. Um, I'm getting the hook over here, so that's probably why I'm getting distracted, but <laughs> this has really been fascinating. This is very interesting, very interesting to me, and, and, I, and I can see the potential, so I appreciate it uh, very, very much. So thank you. Thank you for presenting this morning. Thank you for being thank a you. of USEA. Thank, so, yeah, thank uh, you for allowing us to uh, introduce uh, ESS to uh, USEA and being a new member and, and uh, bringing this technology to, to the U.S. Thank you. Hope we'll see you in person soon. Yep. <laughs> All right. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. So that um, now uh, concludes our, our morning uh, uh, session. Uh, the, well, this part of the morning session. So now I'd like to pass it over to Sheila, who will moderate the second half of this morning's forum. <laughs> 